Welcome to the Summit Series with Ari Melber. Today we are joined by a true trailblazer in music and publishing. Jan Wenner is the founder of the magazine everyone knows, Rolling Stone, a true pillar of rock and roll and music journalism. He has been also named one of the greatest editors of his generation and is co-founder of the well-known Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. He also has a new memoir, Like a Rolling Stone, out now. Thanks for being on the Summit Series. Pleasure and honor. Um, we talk to people who are at the top of their fields. Rolling Stone certainly was that, is that. But it wasn't that when you started it for allegedly 7,500 bucks. Right. We started in San Francisco in 1967 with uh, $7,500, mainly from my mother, my mother-in-law, my stepmother, another friend of ours, and with all volunteers. We started off as, a, as rock fans, you know, trying to spread the word about what we believe is a really important new American art form. And almost more important, that kind of a movement, uh, you know, a, a, an idea about America that was surfacing in rock and roll. And rock and roll was becoming a language that by which young people communicated with each other, ideas and thoughts and philosophies. And we saw early that, or I saw as a, as a college student, just the stuff you could hear Bob Dylan saying and the Beatles. And these are powerful messages, especially for you know, a member of the baby boom just hitting college. Did so, you have any idea that it was going to become what Rolling Stone became? I had no idea what success looked like. I mean, what defined it or what it was or was like, I mean, being in New York City on Fifth Avenue and skyscrapers, no, didn't even occur to me. You know, it was the last thing on my mind. Yeah, and we think about generations. I mean, I wanted to meet John Lennon. <laughs> Not, you know, that, that, yeah, your goal was more, yeah. I want to get in the game. Right, yeah. Let's take a look at you here in about 68. Rock and roll is, you know, is a is a is a particular form that's changed tremendously and keeps changing and vastly changing, making a tremendous amount of changes. And uh, uh, there was no publication around that covered it the way it should be covered. You know, the, that that it treated it the way it deserved to be treated. That uh, you know, understood it really. I got a question, but first of all, good-looking kid, <laughs> if you don't mind me saying. I I look, thank you. But I, when I see that, I think, no wonder that guy was successful. I mean, you want to kind of go with that guy. <laughs> charming. Yeah, I'll, yeah, well, I'll get with that. So, so here's the question. The view that he just espoused there, mm -hmm. which many people could relate to today about their passions, mm -hmm. was that fundamentally an intellectual view? No one is telling our story, and that is a truth that you can document? Or is that an emotional view? Hey, they don't get it. We, we got to go in and do it ourselves. It was both. I mean, first off, I, the, the, I, what I've learned later on with the historical construct was around it and about the moment and all that stuff kind of came to me and dawned me over the years. I mean, I started out because I was a big rock and roll fan. The fact that I happened to be, you know, politically very liberal, you know, was on the, was on the side. I just did it because we loved music. But we found out sooner, soon that we were kind of almost becoming a spokespeople or, uh, of a generation, for a generation. It was emerging from uh, the baby boom. And rock and roll was its language. Mm -hmm. And we spoke that language. And that language spoke to our readers and to the people we were growing up with. And, and we came on that wave. You know, and, and it turned out being really the most consequential, one of the most consequential generations in American history. I mean, it was the biggest population cohort by far. The You're talking about the boomers? Yeah. It was the also wealthiest. The, also the most really well known as the most modest generation. <laughs> Not necessarily modest. I mean, when you get that many kids together, none of them are modest. But with the wealthiest and the best educated because the system had been provided. Right. So let's get in. You, bring, you mentioned politics. You've got several chapters to get into politics. We've got mm -hmm. some Hunter S. Thompson. Right. One of the reasons wh why Rolling Stone rock and roll and that larger movement mattered was as a political force, it's, uh, it didn't debate the system or take the system as a premise to be responded to. It said, we're going to burn this damn system down if we have to. And you saw that in, in, <clears throat> in the war later. You saw it in some of the approach to civil rights. Let me give you a little Hunter Thompson and then back to you. With Rolling Stone, I was, I was given the, the room and the range to uh, really kick ass, you know, to stomp on the terror, as Lord Buckley said. And very few places uh, will give you that. At first, I came up with the idea that he should go to Vietnam and cover the war there. Right. I'd like to ask you why you use drugs. It's been demonstrably proven that 
temper tantrums are not the best way to do interviews, and probably my life will be easier than yours too if I smoke a joint. <laughs> Love him. Um, it's a choice, right? It's a it's a it's professional not, choice, but also a political choice to say we're going to give some people the ball and let them run with it mm -hmm. that couldn't get a, a press pass or that access necessarily. Well, Hunter was a great writer, so sure. and he you know, really cut his own path through. I mean, we didn't have a problem getting access and press passes, but people saw Hunter, how charming he was, what a serious and intelligent man he was, and how wonderful to be with, and he just, the doors opened for him full time. And once we started publishing his campaign coverage, everybody on the campaigns, the McGovern campaign, saw that. McGovern said that there's, there's two versions of the campaign, the one you can read about in the New York Times or the real one in Rolling Stone. And, uh, Hunter, you know, remade campaign coverage. We Absolutely. And put Rolling on the map because he was doing the best job on the biggest story in America, the presidential election. And so remind us, so Fear and Loathing was what came out of the early articles? He, Fear and Loathing, the, on the campaign trail? Yeah. He was covering the campaign full time for a year. And we put those articles together in a book called Fear and Loathing on a Campaign. Well, first they were being published at the time. First they were being published. He was our full time watching correspondent, national affairs correspondent. And again, for people watching us, wherever they are, TV or the internet, let's be clear, this was before the internet. Oh, well before the internet. And so it was almost like the first blogging in that it had that immediacy that we later associate with that instant publishing, but somehow, I guess, you decided to just go with that. I think what made it blog-like was it was so personal. You know, it was about his experiences there and what he saw. It wasn't this kind of like quasi so-called objective stuff, which is kind of a boring recitation of facts and the, what we call pack journals and the same thing that he was doing. But he was having an adventure out there. And while it was very serious political coverage and very intuitive about what the politics were, what the strategy was going to be, I mean, knew more than all the other, you know, senior gentleman wizard correspondents. Uh, but also, you know, had fun with the story. He was writing all these crazy episodes about Senator Ed Muskie shooting up Ibogaine. You know, there's a rumor about that. And the Ibogaine was a drug from the pineal gland, gland of a South American gorilla, which enabled the person taking it to stand still frozen and not move for 24 hours. And <laughs> this kind of stuff caused a riot on the Muskie campaign. Yeah. And, um, but it was the overall quality of it and the imagination of it that really broke us through. So the one political question is, was the center-left Democratic Party, which then moved further left, was it better off in that political milieu where you guys were not on their team uh, than the coalition politics that you have later? In other words, the Rolling Stone, rock and roll, the mm -hmm. whole movement was just, nothing was taken for granted about the people who claimed to represent the left in America. In the same way that LBJ was not treated by the anti-war left as left, right? Was that better, do you think, for results than what you see in the more coalition politics of today? Well, I, I, let me go back to what you said before. It wasn't a choice between burning the system down and staying within the system. Some people did want to burn this system down. We didn't speak for them, and we didn't speak to them. And these were people doing the yippies and Jerry Rubin and all stuff, and we disavowed all that. I thought that the so-called revolution, went, first off, was going to be evolution. Nobody's going to overthrow the government. That's a fantasy. Forget it. And violence didn't help get anybody anywhere. It didn't help anywhere. We want to do more of a revolution of spirit, and I have to say consciousness, say, and uh, about the humanitarian impulses and beliefs. And we spoke to those people and said, that is the way you're going to hear music and rock and roll. And I think... Well, let me push you on that, though. You say that now, sitting here, but you don't feel like you were part of the... Upstart at the time? We were upstarts, but we never advocated overthrowing the system. We believe if you're going to change anything real, you work within the system. And sure, there were pressures coming from around it, without it, but blowing up people with bombs didn't make any well, sense. Well, yeah, I'm not talking about direct violence. What about burning guitars? Well, burning it, you mean on stage at Monterey, Jimi Hendrix? I mean, I, I don't, burning guitars seems kind of harmless, you know? But I don't view that, I never saw that as a measure of protest. What about burning the flag? Burning the flag is, you know, it's a, it's a gesture of free speech that inflames some people. What about burning a joint? I could go on. You know. Burning a joint it works for me. Okay. You know? But uh, it, it wasn't about burning the system down. It was find a way to work within it because if you want to get real, yeah. the system is real and it's powerful yeah. and it's going to be determinative. 
So stop the childish stuff in a sandbox of blowing up things or burning flags or throwing money on the floor of Wall Street. All fun kind of gestures, but blowing up people, killing people. It yeah, I'm not, yeah, I'm not talking. Yeah, I mean, no, I no, no, I, you're not accusing me of that. But that was the difference. We said a right, well, different you're also, view of, of how, to, how to make change in America. Well, even in your answer, though, you're referring to some of the how much some of the radicalism or direct action was on the table in that era. Now mm -hmm. you have a lot more of a coalition-based, digitized right. politics. Right. I also want to get you on the things that you're most known for. And as we know in television, the thing you're most known for may not be you, and it may not be true. Um, but there was this little film, Almost Famous. Ah, uh, yes. And a lot of people have seen around the world. And that, for a new generation, crystallized a moment or a narrative about Rolling Stone. Let's take a look. Hello. William Miller. This is he. William, this is Ben Fong Torres. I'm the music editor at Rolling Stone magazine. We got a couple copies of your stories from the San Diego door. Is this the same William Miller? Yes, it is. Voice of God, howling tugs, the spirit of rock and roll. This is good, solid stuff, man. Did it capture the fundamental spirit, or yeah. is it just a fun story? No, almost famous was like a love letter to Rolling Stone. It was an accurate uh, story about what it was like to be at Rolling Stone the day, in those days. We'd send people out on the road, and you go live with the group for three or four days or a week, and you come back and write this story that's both affectionate, but also very revealing and inside the situation. And it was everybody's dream to go out and live with the rock and roll band. Cameron, Are you a writer or a fan when you go out and spend time with the band? You've got to be both. You do? You really got to be both. You got to be a, a fan in the sense that you love it, you get it, you appreciate it. You're there because you, you love it and you want to talk about it, tell about it. If you're there, if you don't like it, don't go. You know. We, Can we, a fan tell an unbiased truth about, well, what they, about the, the music they love? Well, there's the dilemma, and there was the kind of the root of the, the story in Almost Famous was whether he came back and went too soft instead of telling the truth. And I think you probably walk that line each time. But... The fact of the matter is, these are rock and roll people. These are musicians. These are artists. They're making the world a better place. They're having fun. They're making enjoyment for us. These are people not making, they're not making faulty cars. They're not, you know, politicians. They're not uh, tobacco company heads. So treat them as we did with, as the respect that they deserve as artists and as performers. We're there to, to encourage that stuff. Do you think media about musicians and artists today does that equally well? Not this, this, not in the same way as Rolling Stone, but me media about our say is everywhere. Sure. I mean, the New York Times has a sensational coverage of rock and roll now. It's everywhere. It's on Beats and Demons show. Are you saying Ich ein Rolling Stone now, so uh, to speak? No, I'm saying that. Does everyone get the reference? <laughs> Wait, nobody gets the reference. I'm a Berliner. <laughs> when um, JFK said, "We are all," <clears throat> yeah. Um, Right? Wait, they said in the control room, they get it too. Okay. Uh -huh. But but are we all, is it all Rolling Stone? In other words, and this is something we're interested in on this series, you obviously built something that people cared about, but you also built it in a time of drought. Mm -hmm. Is it now a time of, of great glut? Well, you've got two phenomena going on simultaneously. One is that uh, there's more media available than ever and more choices for entertainment from video games to the available of movies on your phones. If you got a phone, you can see anything in the world you want. On the other hand, so there's many more things competing with for people's attention and for their thinking about things and about their view of life and how they see things. On the other hand, music is more available, more ubiquitous than ever in history. Yeah. If you've got everybody's got an iPhone, you've got twenty four hour days availability of every form of music ever made free. Well, I wanted to ask you about that. Uh, in most of music history, including Rolling Stone's heyday, what we called the charts was defined by people who bought albums, mm -hmm. which is another way to say people with disposable wealth, mm -hmm. which is not the majority of people, or people who are such super fans that they spend rent money on albums, and some people do that. But that was it. Today, these albums are, the charts are defined by who loves and plays music most, mm -hmm. is that in some way less elitist? Well, I want to remind you there was singles. There were 45 RPM singles. I'm familiar. That were cheaper than albums, and people bought lots of money. Same concept, though. Singles. A lot of people, you know, a lot of people are worried about making rent, and they're in debt. 
Whether they're well, buying right. singles or not, they, they, they can't afford to. Today, the same person who's worried about rent can have an ad-supported Spotify, play right. something 100 times. Right. Is it less elitist now? Mm -hmm. It's more available. It's not that it's less elitist. It's what was a popular music has become even more popular and available and accessible to everybody. And I think that's great. You know, that, I mean, honestly, the Beatles today are still the, about the most popular and most listened to group in the world. I mean, some people say they're bigger than Jesus. <clears throat> so, uh, some people have said I don't know that. if you've some heard people, that. I, I heard that, and the guy got stomped down <laughs> who said that. Now I don't think he gets stomped down. Now I think we'd be honest about it, say, probably. Can I tell you something? You're going to, I'm going to get Can it. I tell you something? Please. Jesus should be so lucky to have a Spotify deal. Yeah. <laughs> it may. You know who said that? Who? Jan Wenner. Uh -oh. Tell the blogs because <laughs> I didn't. I don't want to own it. I'm kidding with you. I, we have more for you. We have everyone from. You're Tom. going to get me strung up you know, <laughs> as soon as I leave the studio. We have everyone from Tom Wolf to Springsteen musing on this. Again, I I say this because the whole summit series we put on YouTube, and sometimes people who weren't here there mm -hmm. at that time, they might say, "Are we are we puffing this up at all?" Um, let's take a look. Rolling Stone broke all the rules. It was the first sort of newspaper that talked about what kids talked about, but in a non-condescending way. You know, at the time, Rolling Stone was really radical. I mean, it was it was considered kind of, you know, scary. I remember at the time, Rolling Stone, there was no mainstream media that, that was really interested in, as, in rock music as a serious, uh, that it deserved any serious consideration. So one, shout out to you. Two, the tougher follow-up is, why do we have to go through this with every generation's music? Will we ever, as a society, be able to transcend this, or will there always be this feeling by the new generation that their music's not respected, and the old folks and the boomers don't respect it, and they gotta build their own? Because that, as you know, continues that feeling that they had about their era. Well, I think it's different this time. Uh... The, the music that I came up with in the 60s happened to be of extraordinary power, uh, most, uh, currently then and staying power. I mean, it was, there were great singers, there were great bands, there were great songs being written. I don't think that's an era that's ever been quite surpassed, certainly not now. It's like in Paris in the 20s when Picasso and Matisse and Leger were all together working at the same time. In my era, you had Dylan, the Beatles, the Stones, all working together, listening to each other, uh, trying to top each other, learning from each you other. You don't think today's music is as good as the no, height of the 60s no, and 70s? No, I don't, I, I, don't, I don't quite say that. It's, it's, a, it's different. Um, I don't listen to it enough to be really fair about it, but I don't think it is quite as breakthrough creative as it was then. I don't think the singers are great. I don't, sonically, lyrically, or both? Sonically, it's much different. Uh, now, the sound of it is much different. Rock and roll then, if you listen to Highway 61, the song's almost sounds antique with the guitar sounds in a band. You know, I, l I love it, but today everybody's used to a synthesizer, a drum machine, and a lot of chords, a lot of pop music. I wouldn't really think it's fair to compare. They're, How do you know whether your view is based on your extensive experience? or a type of personal nostalgia? It's hard to know because so much about music is a matter of personal taste and preference. That you can't be objective. I could be objectively and tell you that Aretha Franklin is on an objective basis a better singer than Taylor Swift. I don't think anybody quarrel with that. Could I tell you whether Taylor Swift is better than Megan Thee Stallion or whether you have, a, I don't know, I'm not up to on today's. Do you know which genre has the highest number of new words per song? Um, Dally, it's hip hop, right? It is hip hop. Yeah. If you want to learn new words. Remember, but, but Bob Dylan was doing hip hop of his kind in the, in the mid 60s, you know? He was doing Bob a in the folk basement, fixing up the medicine. Mixing up the medicine. The pavement, thinking about the government. Man got laid off, you know. I mean, My dad loves that song. Uh, your dad, that's too mean to me. I, hey. When I say my dad about anything, I said that's too nice to you, if that's, anything. Okay. That's too nice to you. I think the age thing, but anyway. Age is part of staying alive. We should be so lucky to make it. Um, but my dad loved that. That's the one I think mm -hmm. he has. I think Dylan has the, the cowboy hat on, in the, on that album because we had that mm -hmm. vinyl in my house. But, mm -hmm. uh, but Gil Scott Heron, I would say, would took that, took that to then it being like beat, the beat poets and then mm -hmm. you have the hip hop today. Oh, yeah. But yeah, what do you say to someone who goes, yeah, I mean, Dylan's great, but there was about 18 words in a song total. Well, I mean, I, I don't really mean to say Bob Dylan invented hip-hop, but that style of rapid-fire lyricism 
was prevalent then. I mean, it's not, and he wasn't just the beginner of it. People are doing scat in the 30s and so forth. So, but I'm just saying, you brought words per minute. You know, there was a lot of wordy. I remember- Do you think, just, let me push you on one thing, because you mentioned that dichotomy. Do you think the, the, the Hall of Fame was late to bring in Jay-Z? Not really. I think he was inducted the very year he was eligible. You have to have been making records for 25 years before- Also, oh, everyone, eligible. and then that's, so it's, tw what, teach us about this. It's a 25 year gap, no matter what? No matter, when, from when you first put out for your first commercial recording, it is 25 years before you become eligible to wow. be inducted in the Hall of Okay. Time, which is a measure of saying, you know, we're gonna induct people for their, the length of their work, you know, the length of their career and so forth, not based on, you know, like the Grammys are for today's commercial success. Do you think the Grammys are objectively well done? Um, you know, I really don't know. I think you do. I, it's a lot, it's a, like a, about a lot of performers that don't have a per, don't resonate personally with me. Yeah. So I don't, you know, what Taylor Swift is doing, God bless her, it doesn't move me. I don't I'm gonna yeah. turn on TV. Let's get into Rock and Roll Hall of Fame for a minute, because I don't want to get too deep on it, but it's very interesting when you create something and it takes on a life of its own, mm -hmm. because we're humans. So we tend to care about status and recognition well beyond mm -hmm. perhaps how much we should, and especially in these competitive peer groups. So you got this idea, right? We talked a bit about Rolling Stone. You also got this idea with some people to create a Hall of Fame for rock and roll, correct? Right. And it means something to people. Let's take a look here at, I believe we have uh, you, Mick Jagger talking about your induction. Rock performers were treated as third-class, fly-by-night citizens, having a hard time to form one brain between them. <laughs> Rolling Stone changed all that. He was one of the first music critics and editors that really understood how we as artists felt. This is a wonderful, heartfelt occasion, and I will treasure it, the memory of it, all the way to the airport. It <laughs> It gives me great pleasure to induct Jan Wenner into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. We thought we'd take a look at that. Pretty cool. Yeah. Why does that kind of recognition, uh, primarily then for artists, or perhaps if you want to talk about yourself, but why does that still matter to people? Because a flip side would be to say, well, you and some people made this up. What is this Hall of Fame? It's, it's just a thing that you created. The Hall of Fame at its best it represents the judgment of, of your peer group, of other artists, other industry executives, people, historians, journalists, the people who, who, who you respect the most. And it's a recognition by your peers. It's not a recognition for your sales or your commerciality that, that year or for some of the, it's just a measure of your career as a whole, the worth of it as a whole. And it's deeply meaningful in that way. Uh, it, it's a real tribute. I was thinking, oh, you know, Hall of Fame, I've seen it enough times, it's not gonna get to me. That was one of the best moments of my life. I mean, having Mick induct you was unbelievable, but I just felt I was getting the, the approval of, of, of the assembled people I've written this magazine for and two for so long. And um, uh, it, it couldn't have been more gratifying. And we have tried over the years to maintain the standards for induction that you get in for for great creative achievement and contribution to the artistic process, and as long as we keep to those standards, it's a meaningful thing. Once it start, you know, once you start giving away to you know everybody for less than that, then it demeans the the award. What motivates artists after they've had their hits, their Rolling Stone cover, their world tour? What keeps them going? I think their devotion to art, the fact that they do. They are artists, they want to write, they want to sing, they want to perform, and that's what you do. If you do something that you're extremely talented at and you do it well and you can do that, that's what makes you happy. You know, if you're sitting around not exercising this gift you have to sing, you get frustrated. So I think it's really, I mean, that explains, I think, the longevity of all these careers we've seen, ranging from, you know, Chuck Berry, The Stones, you know, and if you keep going, more forward, I think you'll still see Taylor Swift, not just a single out time, performing for years and years and years, you know? I mean, people perform well into the 60s, 70s. I mean, the Stones, many people are in that road now in their late 70s, Paul McCarthy's 80, shows as good as ever. And I think you'll see that sustaining power among 
the later cars. As good as ever is a big, that's a big claim. I think they, I think in maybe 90% of what they were, but so close to it. Still putting out records that are worthy of their career highs, you know? And uh, I think that will remain, and I think also, because rock and roll and hip hop within it is a music of joy, of happiness, mm -hmm. you know? And it moves people, and I think it's got enormous staying power. I mean, as an artist, it's deeply emotional, deeply personal. I want to do a little politics before we leave, and then a lightning round. Politics is just, were there any politicians that you saw who got or captured rock and roll in that time? Jimmy Carter was who I call the first rock and roll president. I mean, he knew it. He knew all the stuff about Dylan and uh, was, you know, fundraised early with the Allman Brothers Band and appreciated what we did, what the values of that generation were. Um, you go forward, Bill Clinton was like, well, I don't know, Reagan knew nothing about it. Uh, Bill Clinton was a, you know, saxophonist, he liked Elvis, but his, his favorite Beatle was Paul McCartney. I'll tell you that. Most, and, and Al Gore, who didn't get to be president, unfortunately, was a stone cold fan. I mean, the minute the New Dell or the New Beatles album came out in the college, he'd tell me, he'd get out his headphones and he'd sit there and listen to it 12 times. Make of that what you will. I know what I make of that. Uh, Obama was a real rock and roll fan. When, when I first, the first time I interviewed him, I like to ask politicians what their favorite music is, what they listen to. No, it's kind of a gag, but start to get a sense of who they are and introduce them to our readers. So he liked, um, among other things, he mentioned it. He liked Bob Dylan so much. He mentioned how he, which Miles records he liked. And he picked exactly the right Stones records that he liked. And I said, well, what Dylan is a deal? He says, well, while I'm on a campaign trail, the thing that really speaks to me right now is Maggie's Farm. <laughs> Now, I think about Maggie. It's not, it wasn't blowing in the wind or the times they are changing. But it was Maggie's Farm, a song about working for the man. I ain't going to work for the man no more. No the man more. comes in, he puts in a, a bedroom wall is made out of bricks. I mean, oddball. That tells you something. That's interesting. Trump? You didn't get to Trump. I never spoke to him. I mean, I, I've run into him in New York, but I never interviewed with him. And I don't. Because you had Obama was the that was the Rolling Stone cover, right? When he first ran, the first we had Obama on the cover eight times. Oh wow! So why would he continue to talk to Rolling Stone so much? Obama? Yeah, he liked us. We were his ally. He wanted to speak to our audience. Yeah, I think he enjoyed the interviews because my interviews were not meant to be gotcha interviews or talking about, oh, is what's going to happen tomorrow in the Middle East. It was really about, how do you see this issue? How do you see your job? Are you enjoying it? I mean, what's speaking to you now? What is resonating in the country? And, and getting a broader view, and these were good interviews with him, with Clinton, uh, and with Al about, on these themes of, uh, you know, the broader themes. That, do you think culture drives politics more or politics drives culture? I think it's a little of both. But... I think we're in an era where culture is really driving politics enormously. Yeah. And it started, I think, in the 60s. Because in the 60s, where you saw the rock and roll culture take power. And it, when it started out, there was no politics on television. But as it moves on, all of a sudden you find the most serious political and social issues being addressed on television. You have a teenage show like Beverly Hills 90210 dealing with issues about abortion and homosexuality. Now they're really hot button topics and get a more honest discussion of that. Mm in the arts, whether it's movies or rock, uh, music or not, than you get in the halls of Congress, which is afraid to even touch this issue. Did the boomers win? Did the boomers win? That's a pretty broad question. The boomers got a lot done and won on a lot of things. And we are today living in a far more liberated society than we were at the beginning of the 60s. When you look at women's rights, when you look at sexual rights, when you look at abortion, when you look at the environment, when you look at racism, when you look at all these things, Enormous progress has been made. To say we've won or reached an end point is being incorrect. There's lots of progress still to go. But it was this influence of this very powerful voice that said, we want freedom. And now it's saying the same thing. We want economic equality. Yeah. We, want this, we want the world not to burn up. We still advocate the values of life, liberty, you know, and the pursuit of happiness, yeah. which includes you know, medical care, Includes a sustainable planet, includes racial equality, treating women as equal people. Well, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, if I'm not mistaken, that's uh, Sly and the Family Stone quote. That is exactly right. That's, that's right. right? And Sly, okay. In a drug haze, he came out with it. <laughs> uh, lightning round is in a word or a sentence to the best of your ability. 
Okay? In a word or a sentence. Okay. Oh, that's, that's tough. It's tough, yeah. but it's take it as a challenge. Okay. Bob Dylan. Genius. Greatest writer of our times. Bruce Springsteen. Another genius. Another greatest writer. Uh, one of the most thoughtful, meaningful people I've ever met. Aretha Franklin. Oh, and that, oh, go ahead. The person who enjoys performing on stage more than any other single person I've ever met. <laughs> Aretha Franklin. Fantastic voice. Incredible story. The queen of soul. Janis Joplin. Sad, unhappy, great voice, tragedy. Joni Mitchell. Beautiful singer, poet of our times. The Beatles. Well, this is the, these are the only relevant people of our, of our times. I mean, we lived our life through the Beatles. Mm. Rolling Stones, the band. Greatest rock and roll band in the world. Still. World's the greatest, yeah, absolutely. Okay. I mean, there's a couple others that might give them a run for their money, particularly East Street Band, but, you know, the Stones are the world's greatest rock and roll band. Rolling Stone, the magazine. Uh, made a difference, published some great people, was a very influential voice in American life and American policy. Spotify. The future. I like it. It's on my phone. Beyonce. I don't know much about Beyonce. Queen, Queen Bay, they call her. Yeah. Um, genius performer. Yeah. But beyond that, I don't know much about her. Michael Jackson. Sad case. What a tragedy. I mean, beautiful voice singer. I mean, a real artist. And had a tragic flaw inside him that wound him up so tight and made him so fragile and brittle yeah. that he just broke. Drake. Don't know much. Don't know. No. Okay. Don't know much about history. <laughs> or or ge biology. Or geometry. Or geometry. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. I knew you were going to do this. I knew if I had you here, you would quote lyrics the whole time. I, I thought I, we have to be ready for that. <laughs> All right. The boomers were right about... Civil rights, the environment, women's rights, dr the drug war being a fraud, mm. the Vietnam War being a horrible mistake, about the terrible treatment of black people, uh, a, the question about whether America was going to live up to its ideals or not. Mm. And we insisted that they do. We do live up to our ideals. And we insist upon that today. And I believe the younger generation, all still listening to rock and roll, believe the same thing. That we still are all out for justice for everybody. The boomers were wrong about. How fast things could change. Uh, they, you know, as boomers, they, we were young and immature. We expect things to move fast overnight and got too disappointed early. I think uh, there was wrong headed not to kind of work a little more within the system. You know, that, that voting didn't count, that politics was like corrupt, all corrupt. It's not true. I mean, you don't really have a choice. I mean, and there's huge consequences to your vote. You know, if you vote for Gore, we're going to get one world. If you vote for Bush, we got another yeah. world. You know, that alone will tell you. So I think there was that dismissal of politics too early was wrong. This current youngest generation, some call it Gen Z. Mm -hmm. Gen Z is right about? I don't know much about what Gen Z, I mean, first of all, I'd hate to be called Gen Z since the implication is that that's it, it's over. And there's so much. Well, I don't know if you've been keeping track of the temperatures. Exactly. I mean, there's. But you know something about it because. You exist in this world, and you talk to younger people, and you may have younger people have in your younger. family, and you're not allowed to dodge questions. I don't know if you remember that from your time at the magazine. I, first, okay, I'm not sure that Gen Z as a concept even exists, and there's such a thing, or is it not just another marketing term like Gen Y? People you know? under 30 in 2022 are right about... Is, they've got a tough road ahead. They're right about... So what are we going to do about the environment thing? Because if, if we don't get it straight, it's within their time frame. When they become adults, they're going to be affected by the consequences of the world that gets more and more unlivable and resources start to dry up and the competition for them becomes serious and impacts really badly the way of life. I think with that background, uh, they've got a question whether they really are Gen Z 
hmm. or it's going to come around again. And what they're wrong about. I don't know what they're wrong about. I mean, I, when I see young people, they stand, to me, still for so much of the values of, 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 of youth, of freshness, of honesty, of, of uh, being spontaneous. I, I, and, and in my lifetime, we've seen such incredible ignorance and, and evil done by our elders who have hmm. who proved to make such terrible misjudgments about the war in Vietnam, about what we're doing to the environment now, and about other things. And so I, I think the spirit of youth is still there, still questioning, and still asking what's going on. Let's make it right. Final three. Failure means? Not, not being happy, not having done something. Enjoy yourself with your kids or your country. Mm. Success means? Happiness. Being at the summit means? Having walked a long, long, walked a long distance up Getting to look around and seeing a lot of different stuff, and then hoping you can make it down step by step instead of sliding. Or jumping. Or jumping. Um, thanks for making the time on the series. Our pleasure, yeah. Appreciate Absolutely. it. Absolutely.